rise. Yes, Mr. Cantor. My Lord and Ladies, I uh, and Mr. Carter represent the appellant in this case, uh, Mrs. James, and Mr. Martin represents the respondent, Priory Education Services Limited. And you'll notice Mr. Carter isn't present. Uh, we had emailed the court, uh, and I think, I uh, hope, that he and will be live streaming uh, as a way of uh, participating. From Australia? From Australia. My clerk said. Well, that's. that's Fine by us. Goodness knows what time of day it is, but um, <laughs> yes. And, and with your consent, uh, I'll have um, a WhatsApp open with him on my laptop so that we can communicate with each other. Yes. Some to make various points or articulate points which I have done. The well. master of the roles would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my lords and ladies, uh, I hope you've got a both party skeleton argument. I think um, probably both of us. Uh, uh, should be on a naughty step and um, not updating our skeleton argument with um, bundle pages, and I apologise. Well, don't, no, don't, don't, don't worry about that. Um, the, the, the one we have from you, 3rd of March. It's wrongly titled. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's not seeking permission to appeal, you've got that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'll cross out seeking permission to appeal. Okay, well, I was going to, once I realised my <coughs> planner, I was thinking about emailing in and through anxiety and, and, and realising it's all right. So long as we've got the right one. Yeah. <clears throat> Are you ready for me to start? Yes. Okay. The facts in this case are relatively straightforward, uh, summarised by the tribunal judge uh, in relatively short form. The uh, uncontroversial facts which are central to this case found at, if I can take you to paragraph 13 of the Tribunal Reasons, which is at page 76 of the Appeal Bundle. And whilst the and paragraph starts with the words, the claimant's evidence was that, which indicates uh, some uncertainty when you start reading, if you uh, go right to the end of the paragraph, the judge says, we accept all the claimant's yes. evidence on so that's helpful when you read it to understand this isn't merely the claimant's account, uh, it's fully accepted. Yes. And what we see is an, an unfortunate set of facts uh, which on any account um, could be, uh, uh, you know, tempt me to refer to the claimant um, to ease, uh, claimant in, in an incredibly difficult position, she's done absolutely nothing wrong, she has a negligent representative uh, found to be negligent by the employment judge. And well, not, found to be dishonest. Uh, uh, and dishonest. Yeah. Um, she's not told about the um, uh, strikeout threat. She's not told about the strikeout. And she, she's kept in the dark completely. And in some senses, it's difficult to see a more innocent party uh, in, uh, uh, in, a, in cases like this. Usually there's maybe some often there might be a bit of a turning of a blind eye or burying your head in the sand type thing when you miss correspondence or wrong address type cases where you should have updated um, uh, uh, a company's house website. I think it's one of, one of the uh, uh, cases that we, that we may have seen. And so this is truly an innocent uh, person here, a person who has already done nothing wrong. And all of the liability and the wrong lies with her um, dishonest uh, and negligent representative. So we see those facts there. We see the relevant law in relation to this matter at paragraph 17. I don't make any criticism of the employment judge at this stage for the way in which the employment judge set out the relevant principles. What I will say, though, in passing, is the summary of Lindsay and Einstein, the ratio that's at the tail end of paragraph 17, failings of a party's representative do not generally constitute ground for review. As a summary, I don't think there's anything wrong with that summary. It lacks nuance, but um, we're not um, uh, appealing on the grounds of um, uh, uh, the summary uh, or, or the, the judge lacked nuance in uh, his or her application of the uh, law or the law to the facts. And so as a, as a broad summary, no problem with that. And then what we do is we get to the application of the law to facts at paragraph 21. 
So in this, um, uh, in these reasons, we have a remarkably easy job in some ways uh, of uh, facts and application law uh, and application of the law. In fact, sometimes you will, you'll know from um, judgments and reasons they seem to blend into each other. But here we have uh, very discrete um, sections: facts, law, uh, application of law to facts. And so I, I'm not suggesting that you only look at paragraph 21, of course that would be inviting you uh, to fall into error. Um, uh, the judgment must be taken, as, the reasons must be taken as a whole, but it's inescapable, it's very difficult to escape from the fact that actually the totality of the analysis, legal analysis of application to laws of facts is found in paragraph 21. Now I don't criticise the judge for that, um, but it's difficult to look outside of that um, when one is looking at the analytical process undertaken by the judge. And I'm going to turn to the analytical process in, in just a moment. Um, but you, you said the analytical process in, undertaken by the judge, which reminds me to ask, does either of you know, you weren't there, was it employment judge Jill Kelly sitting alone? Um, um, it, it says at the at the top before E.J. Kelly, but um, she keeps referring to the tribunal as we. It can't be the royal we, so it, it, was it her plus members or her alone? So, so the answer is I don't know. Uh, um, oh my Lord, I'm afraid I can't assist. No. But what I would say is these types of hearings should be a single judge. Yes. And so it would be surprising uh, if it was a panel of three for um, what was an application for mm. Reconsideration and cross application. Yes. Well, I, I, I think unless somebody tells us otherwise, we ought to assume that, as it says before E.J. Kelly, it means before E.J. Kelly alone, and that that, uh, and that we is a, is a mistake. <laughs> and, and so, what I'm going to do now is is go through the analysis of paragraph twenty one. It's slightly out of sequence in my skeleton argument, and I apologise for that. Um, but where I start the analysis is at paragraph 29, but before I go into that, I'll set out, I suppose, the two broad ways of analysing this, which are overlapping. Uh, the, uh, my submission is, is that when you, one reads paragraph 21, what's immediately apparent is that the internal logic of the paragraph only makes sense if the word generally is removed from it. And I'll explain that um, uh, in two different ways. Uh, one is that the paragraph doesn't make any sense with the word generally, unless the employment tribunal will go on to deal with the general proposition and any exceptions to the general proposition. I'm going to call that kind of the ordinary language uh, um, uh, analysis. And then there's a slightly more academic uh, syllogistic analysis, um, which is that it only makes sense syllogistically if you remove the word generally uh, from the syllogism, which I've set out paragraph 31 of this paragraph. And when you remove the word generally from the syllogism, so that you're left with a valid syllogism, and you're left with what is a, a blanket application of a general rule, uh, which is the, uh, sorry, the, ma the, um, the major premise in the syllogism. Um, so I'll, I'll go through both of those, um, uh, uh, both of those arguments now. And the first, the ordinary language analysis, is found at paragraph. Uh, paragraphs 29 and 30 of my skeleton argument. And what we see is, um, the tribunal says, the judge says, the claimant didn't comply with the order and failed uh, to respond to a strikeout warning from the respondent. I, I don't take issue with the fact that um, that doesn't refer, it refers to the claimant rather than the representative. It's clear from the preceding paragraphs the judge understood that it was the fault of the representative, not the claimant. And this is just um, uh, not, not criticising the judge, um, just a relatively loose language, um, uh, with which no criticism should be le levelled at the judge for that. The claimant relied on default of her representative, um, uh, OASL. However, under the principle of Lindsay, failings of a party's representative will not generally constitute grounds for review. Now, if one were reading and not seeing what was below that, one would usually expect something to follow on from that. However, the principles in Lindsay failing the party's representative will not generally constitute grounds for review and, or, and go into an analysis of why, in this case, um, the general proposition should not be departed from. We don't see that. Uh, and, and the absence of that suggests that 
the only real way to understand it is the judge understood the principle in Lindsay as the end of the inquiry. As never constituting grounds. For exactly. And that's really the only way you can, uh, using the ordinary language analysis, understand that. Uh, and then the and going to the syllogistic way of reading it, which is slightly more analytical than probably the same analysis, is at paragraph uh, 31. And, and I've removed the word generally to try and make the syllogism work. Failing of parties representative will not constitute grounds for review. The claimant relied on the little uh, representative, therefore um, uh, there aren't valid uh, grounds for review. Uh, and um, from, uh, so logistically, uh, there's a, without getting too uh, into, into, I don't think it's overly complex, um, there's a difference between a valid syllogism and a sound syllogism. A valid syllogism simply is one which makes sense logically, even if the premises were not true. A sound syllogism is one which needs to have a, a valid logic to it, but also true uh, propositions and conclusions. And so you can have a valid syllogism, which you have at paragraph 31, one which makes sense logically, even if the major premise uh, in this case is um, untrue. And so the only um, uh, way uh, my submission is, is when one reads paragraph 21 syllogistically, the only way it makes sense logically is to remove the word generally. But when you remove the word generally, which you see that I've done as the major premise, uh, you see that that's an error of law because it's the application of the Blanco rule. So those are my submissions on the proper reading of paragraph 21. And um, if I take you to the first line of paragraph 13, which is my um, first primary attack on this, uh, these reasons, the Employment Tribunal erred in treating Lindsay as a rule of law giving a conclusive answer in every apparently similar case, if the judge applied a blanket rule, I think my learned friend would agree that that is an error uh, and the appeal should succeed. And so even if we don't go into the analysis, which I'm going to go into in just a moment, into relation to the fair opportunity test or the exceptional circumstances test, which are um, uh, uh, put um, skin on the bone of that broad proposition, if you're with me on the correct reading of paragraph 21, on either the ordinary analysis or the syllogistic reasoning or uh, an analysis of your own, uh, then uh, I, I believe that the appeal should be allowed on that basis alone, a relatively straightforward proposition. The judge applied a blanket rule, shouldn't have done, fell into error. So that's the kind of uh, um, unglamorous, um, uh, straightforward, uh, not much, uh, only a textual analysis, not no analysis. I say unglamorous because there's no uh, analysis of the law required. Of course. Um, so, we then, uh, if I can, move on to. Are, are you are, are you seeking on this appeal um, an order that the reconsideration decision be reversed, um, or at once and for all, so that the 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 case then proceeds on its merits, or are you are, are you limiting yourself to um, an uh, an order that that it's sent back for re reconsideration by some other um, uh, employment judge? I I, I I got the impression that you, you you were seeking to to succeed outright. So in an ideal world, I'd like to see succeed outright. Yeah. You may not be with me on the succeeding outright. You may say. Um, I think the, um, uh, uh, I remember the name of the case at the moment, it's the um, uh, Mr. Lord Justice Underhill decision, which talks about if there's only one uh, outcome, then you, the court, or the EAT can deal with the matter. Uh, but if you think there um, uh, uh, is potentially more than one outcome, you need to remit. That's intrinsically tied up with my third ground, uh, albeit the perversity test and the only one outcome test are not quite the same. Uh, there's a large overlap between ground three and, and that question which you need to ask. There's no factual dispute anymore. No, exactly. And so there, there doesn't need to be any further factual inquiry, which is obviously helpful in allowing you and your colleagues to make a decision where you with me on, um, uh, on any point. Um, but if you thought that on a proper analysis, a tribunal below could conceivably arrive at a different decision, then I think the proper 
other courses into remit as much as um, sometimes they're great from a um, use of judicial resources perspective. Well, a, a possible view of this is that it, it, it is all or nothing. That if you, if you succeed in persuading us that the only possible um, decision on the 3rd of July was to reverse the strike out, Re -recon to reconsider under Rule 71E and reverse the strike out, then you win. Um, if that wasn't the only um, uh, reasonable decision, then probably you lose, don't you? Well, I think, uh, my Lord, what I'd say is that it depends on which ground I succeed on. Yeah. And how I succeed. So if I succeed merely on this one, this quite narrow point about the reading of paragraph 21, um, you then need to decide, was there only one, uh, uh, was there only one outcome? And given that I've let's assume I've lost on ground three, you probably have to remit the matter. Um, but if I were to succeed on ground three, um, as I said, they're not identical tests of the first two tests and the only one outcome test, mm -hmm. but there is a, um, uh, yeah, an overlap, a yeah. large um, uh, um, a degree of overlap. And so I'm using that as a, as a broad kind of approximation. And so I think there are different outcomes. If, we, if you simply find that the tribunal fell into error, then you need to consider the uh, question of whether there's more out more than one outcome. But if you think that it, the, the decision wasn't perverse, then probably you wouldn't have to remit the matter. All right. Thank you. So moving on now to the law, um, and I'll start with the case of Lindsay and Einstein. I set out paragraph 13 in my skeleton argument, what um, uh, uh, we say we place the authority for, which is that where a party has had a fair opportunity to present his or her argument on a point of substance, a, uh, the failings professional or otherwise of a party's representative will not generally constitute grounds for review. Uh, and if I can take you to the decision, which is uh, the ratio of the decision, the parts which I'm going to take you to, uh, paragraph 32 of the Parliament of Authority. And I think it's um, uh, paragraph, sub, sub paragraph four there. There's a, uh, a rendition of the, uh, some of the facts in Flint, um, some of the facts which are, um, factors which a tribunal needs to take into account uh, for Flint, so the interest of the party seeking the review, but also the person resisting, um, the interest in the public, uh, um, sorry, the interest in the finality of litigation, and then in the case of Trimble and Super Travelers cited. And uh, it's then quoted, uh, and that's a decision of um, Mr. Justice Brown Wilkinson, as he then was. And we can see uh, it's the indented paragraph uh, which I wanted to take you to. If you could um, read that to yourselves rather than me reading it aloud, and then I'll uh, take you through the relevant passages. Rationale for that later on in the 
ambiguity. Um, but where, on the other hand, there is a procedural mishap uh, or oversight or even the word more neutral occurrence, procedural occurrence, um, which means that a party hasn't had a fair opportunity to present their argument, then that does open the door uh, for a, a review. And then if I can take you to the bottom of page 32 and uh, running into page 33, and this is an application of the law to the facts in this case. The facts in the present case cannot be viewed as a procedural mishap or procedural shortcoming or occurrence um, of a kind which constitutes a denial uh, to a party of a fair and proper opportunity to present their case. So that's the way that the matter was addressed in Lindsay. The first question asked in Lindsay was this, was this the type of um, procedural mishap or occurrence which led to a denial of a party for the fair um, uh, to have a fair opportunity to present their case. And then uh, the judge sets out the facts, which is that the claimant's solicitor in that case um, uh, didn't deal with the issue of, I think it's um, mitigation, my apologies. Um, An extension under 68. Sorry, my, yeah, yeah, my apologies, sorry. I'm grateful, uh, my lady. So um, the question is whether there should be an extension um, of time. Yeah. And the matter was raised by the respondent both in, a, in skeleton argument and in submission. And it simply wasn't addressed by the claimant solicitor in that case. And yes, so, so it was the just and equitable extension under 68.6. Yes. Great. Um, so, and then what we can see is the, and, and this is the part which has been taken to be the ratio of the case, which is the, um, the sentence which starts with failings is uh, just after halfway down. Failing of a party's representative, professional or otherwise, will not generally constitute grounds for review. That's a dangerous path to follow, uh, and it explains um, the difficulty in uh, allowing that door to be opened because it requires would then require um, uh, a, an investigation into what was said between the lawyer uh, or representative and the party. But um, my primary submission in relation to the reading of Lindsay is it's wrong to simply look at that sentence and say that's the ratio that the ratio is slightly more complex than that, uh, and that the, um, uh, the proper way to understand uh, that paragraph and the ratio of the case is that whilst failings of a party's representative will not generally constitute grounds for review, a procedural occurrence which constitutes a denial to a party of a fair and proper opportunity to present the case can properly be the subject of a successful <coughs> review. And so that's the nuance which um, uh, I uh, submit should be um, uh, generally uh, uh, um, uh, should generally be adopted by tribunals and courts when thinking about the principle in Lindsay. It's not merely failing of a party's representative. It's more complex than that. It's failing of a party's representative and um, won't generally constitute grounds for review, but a procedural occurrence uh, which constitutes a denial uh, of a party a fair and proper opportunity to present their case can uh, give rise uh, to successful. Review application. So that's the um, uh, principle in Lindsay. We describe that in our skeleton argument as the fair opportunity test. Uh, we say uh, that that's uh, taken from both Trimble and Lindsay. And uh, I then, in my uh, in our skeleton argument, um, deal with the cases of Williams and Ferrisand, Newcastle City Council, etc. Um, I'll deal, if I can, with Newcastle City Council and Marsden. Yes. And the facts of that case, and I'll turn you to it in just a moment, and that the claimant was advised by his counsel that um, he didn't need to attend a pre term review where his disability status was going to be determined. And because the claimant didn't turn up to give evidence, the tribunal found uh, that the claimant had not established uh, that their disability was long term and so hadn't established disability. Uh, a, a, the claimant applied for a review uh, and that review was successful. And the relevant passage is at page 91 of the bundle of authority, in paragraph 6b. So I think I quote from 90 to start off with, but I think I'll. Um, I'll start with paragraph 16, if I can. So that refers back to Williams and Ferris and Sedexo and Gibbons. That, that 
I've got to start really talking about a slightly different issue, which is about the issue of exceptionality. Often we see in these sorts of cases, not just in this um, a narrow jurisdiction, but across the employment law jurisdiction and discrimination jurisdiction, that where we have a rule, people talk about, um, judgments talk about exception, exceptions to the rule, and that's often understood as being uh, a requiring ex exceptionality. And here what um, Mr. Justice Underhill was doing uh, um, was simply saying that um, the test is not one of exceptionality, which is uh, not um, directly relevant to the um, uh, the fair opportunity test, but relevant in, in, in understanding broadly the position of the law. And it's then paragraph 19, which uh, I'd like to take you to, uh, my lords and ladies. Um, <coughs> what we see there is And the relevant passage says um, it doesn't follow that the judge's decision, and this is the decision to allow the review, or his fundamental reasoning were wrong. It's clear that he attached decisive weight to the related fact, A, that the claimant's counsel misled the tribunal, and B, that by doing so, he deprived him of, of an opportunity of an adjournment which would otherwise have been granted. Those are exceptional circumstances. And so what we see here, and this is, if you remember when I was um, uh, commenting on the tribunal judgment, we have a general proposition, but of course the general proposition must allow for exceptions to that generality. And here, Mr Justice Underhill was referring to the exceptional circumstances of a, a, a counsel misleading uh, a, um, uh, their client. Uh, which resulted in them being deprived of an opportunity which they would have otherwise been granted. And that sounds very much like the fair opportunity test which you've um, uh, uh, taken to Lindsay uh, and Trimble. And um, it takes the case outside the straightforward fresh evidence category. It takes the case uh, um, outside the ordinary run of cases where a party suffers the, um, from a wrong or indeed incompetent advice of his representative. So that's, again, what the, if you remember in Lindsay, it's incompetent on Trimble, it's incompetent representative. This case, Mr. Justice Underhill said, takes it outside because you have a dishonest, um, um, so you have a being misled by counsel and the depriving of an opportunity. So those are two factors which take it outside the ordinary run of cases. Um, whereas in cases of that kind, the overall interest of justice, the particular weight to be attached to finality, finality of litigation may well require uh, the party to bear um, himself. The consequences of the errors of his own representative, sorry, the consequences of the errors of his own representative, the judge was entitled to take a different view on the particular uh, uh, facts of this case. Um, it was peculiarly hard on the claimant to have to bear the consequences of the judge found to be plain misconduct, at least where, uh, as here, the employer suffers no prejudice beyond the fact that the case, uh, the case they believe to be done with, would need to be reopened. And the importance of maintaining finality of litigation could reasonably be judged to be outweighed by the particular injustice in the case. Now, I make an observation here that Mr. Justice Underhill is not merely saying this was a conclusion which the judge was entitled to arrive at. He appears to be endorsing the conclusion in his analysis. And I, I think one of his points which can be made against me is that um, in, in a number of the judgments, what the EAT is simply doing is upholding the decision yes. of the court below. But it, it, in my submission, whilst Mr Justice Underhill was um, upholding the decision of the court below, he appears to be agreeing with it. And because he describes those circumstances as exceptional circumstances and gives an analysis of why um, those exceptional circumstances change the balancing uh, exercise which a tribunal needs to undertake. But he does go on to say that even if he took the view that the errors were only sufficient to vitiate the exercise, he would have conducted the exercise afresh because the parties agreed that that was a sensible approach and would have reached the same conclusion. Yes. I'm grateful, my lady. So, um, so, so, so that is relevant in the sense of what we see is we see an appellate body 
um, not merely upholding because it's within the range of decisions which a tribunal could arrive at, but actually making comment yeah. um, uh, on the validity of the decision and distinguishing between um, you know, run of the mill error where an actor forgets to raise something and that happens probably on a, a daily basis uh, in courts up and down the, uh, the country um, uh, and different to dishonest or being misled um, uh, leading to a denial of an opportunity. It's worth um, also um, uh, taking to paragraph 20 whilst we're here, it's a separate point but related point, which is um, Mr Justice Armitage's observation uh, about um, the, what used to be said was, well, look, you sue your representative. And uh, the observation he makes there is the trend of the modern, so it's two lines, uh, second line down of paragraph 20, the trend of the modern authorities in this and analogous situations is to emphasize the inherently less satisfactory nature of such a remedy. And we know that it, it's relatively straightforward to bring employment tribunal claims, there's no SMO cross jurisdiction, but if you want to sue your representative in professional negligence, you're generally going to have to find a, um, a no-win, no-fee lawyer of some sort. Uh, they um, are going to apply their own test, and one of the tests which uh, can be particularly difficult in these sorts of cases is the test of causation. You can establish your negligence, uh, easy, uh, but um, establishing causation is problematic because then you have to analyse the underlying case. Uh, and so often, um, the uh, uh, party, the innocent party in this case, is left in an under unsatisfactory situation where they can't litigate their employment tribunal claim and can't sue because uh, a, a no win no fee solicitor might consider that the underlying case doesn't have sufficient merits for them to, uh, uh, to take it on and they're going to lose on the issue of causation. Well it might be a slam dunk on liability but um, we don't even know do we whether Mr. Johnstone, as an individual, was regulated by anyone, whether the company is solvent. I suppose you don't know. Mr. Martin, were, were, were your clients ever paid any of the wasted costs? My Lord, um, the cost sword was not in force. I, I don't know the timeline, which is okay. what's going to be important. And I know at some stage, attempts to enforce it were abandoned because the company was insolvent. Yeah. But at the time the decision was made, there was no submission on behalf of the claimant that her representatives were insolvent or imminent to insolvent. But I can't assist no. the court with when that might have happened. Yeah. And I think the point you make, my lord, is actually there are multiple hurdles. Yeah. You've got liability, which are case straightforward, oh, yeah. causation, really problematic, uh, and then you've got um, enforcement, which is again problematic. So not... Yeah. A multitude of, of, of obstacles in an innocent party's way. Yes. There is also <coughs> a, a considerable time lapse in this case, too. I mean, yes. this is you know, 2019. Yes, mm. exactly. My Lord. Um, so, if All I right. can. Are we, are we done with um, Marsden? We are, we are, I'm grateful, my Lord. Yes. Um, now, I, I'm not entirely sure whether you want me to take through the. Through, uh, take you through the other uh, cases, Minister of Justice and Burton, Banerjee uh, and Nambia. Uh, all we really say with those is um, that they, broadly speaking, seem to confirm the fair opportunity test, albeit not necessarily as clearly, and I think um, as clearly as probably um, as I would like. Um, Lady Justice Simler will remember the case of Nambia because I think um, uh, uh, she was in, involved. But it's a completely different. Com completely different. And the reason why it found its way into um, uh, our skeleton argument is merely because um, it shows that across different jurisdictions, the idea that a, an opportunity to have a fair hearing is central when considering whether one can revisit the outcome. So not really central to employment law or discrimination law, uh, but helpful to see that uh, in other jurisdictions where it's a criminal case, um, that similar sorts of considerations uh, are taken into account. And so um, that's uh, what we say is the fair opportunity test. Uh, one of the things uh, which um, I think has to be considered is how one phrases that test. And I, I think I want to make clear that we're not suggesting 
that in every single case where somebody has a party has not had a fair opportunity, a tribunal must grant the application for review. Because one can think of certain circumstances, uh, firstly, that would amount to a fettering of discretion, which Mr Justice Underhill uh, and all of the uh, lots of other appellate cases have suggested courts shouldn't be doing. So if we came up with this rule, which is um, if somebody's denied uh, an opportunity, a tribunal must grant the application review, that would fetter the discretion. Uh, the way in which I would invite um, the court to, to consider the matter is, it's obviously a very important factor, and it's the type of factor, in some senses, we can see that there's a general proposition going the other way, if it's a mere mistake of a, net, a representative, well, one might have a general proposition going the other way, which is, if a party is denied, generally, if a party is denied an opportunity, that will give good grounds for review. We're not saying that it must do, because that would amount to a fetter. And a similar sort of um, uh, uh, um, emphasis is, is, played for, uh, is paid uh, um, on, for example, prejudice in extension of time cases, discrimination claims. So um, uh, there you say, well, prejudice is not decisive, but it's a very important factor. It will usually uh, uh, um, uh, uh, determine the issue, but it's not determinative. And obviously, all the factors are taken into account, the legal discussion, etc. So that's the way in which uh, I pitch, uh, we pitch the um, issue of the fair opportunity test. Not that it gives an answer in every single case, but it's a, 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 it's a general proposition that where a party hasn't had a fair opportunity, and that should generally lead to a, um, uh, um, a review. But imagine, for example, a, a party comes along three years after the event, and um, somebody here unfortunately died uh, um, uh, in, the, in the interim. Well, you may say, actually, that's not really a straightforward case, and um, that may be a case where discretion isn't granted in, in allowing the review. And so uh, we're not suggesting that there's a, a blanket rule that should be applied where a party's been denied a fair opportunity. We're just saying that the, submit that the general proposition is that that would ordinarily um, uh, 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 lead to a, a successful review. But of course, uh, there's a discretion to the tribunal and all of that. And the, um, uh, in dealing with that matter too, it's probably worth just emphasising the Article 6 right and why this is a particularly important factor. There's, I think, a reference to um, the textbook of uh, Zuckerman, but the point is a, a, a relatively straightforward point, which is that the right to a, um, I think it's a paragraph 27 must go in Zuckerman, I apologise for going out of sequence. And a due regard must be had to the fundamental personal nature of the rights of the common law and under, under Article 6. And so um, all uh, 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 we submit is that because of the fundamental and personal nature of the right to be heard, both at common law and under Article 6, that this, uh, the right to be heard is an important, very important factor, um, which then creates this general proposition that if you deny the right to be heard, that would ordinarily lead to a review, albeit um, it's to, uh, left to the discretion of the tribunal. And if I uh, can then move on to the um, exceptional circumstances test, which I've really dealt with um, when we dealt with Marsden, but I'll just uh, deal with it as a, a slightly separate matter. So we submit that uh, there's the um, two different ways if, uh, uh, this might be again overly, overly analytical um, but there's a fair opportunity consideration which is again tied up with the exceptional circumstances test but a party uh, and a tribunal should consider whether there's an exception to the general proposition whether there are any exceptional circumstances uh, and I've taken you as paragraph 24 of my skeleton argument where I cite uh, paragraph 19 of Mr Justice Underhill's decision uh, in Marsden, yes. uh, again, um, he uh, sets out, and I think I've made the point uh, earlier in my submission, that you have a general proposition, there may be exceptional circumstances, and dishonesty of a representative is an uh, exceptional circumstance. One may also say that being denied an opportunity for a fair hearing is also um, a, an exceptional circumstance. So 
my lords and ladies, those are the, um, that takes my submission up to uh, paragraph 25. I think it probably, it, 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 you probably covered yeah, the, question is, the whole of you ground have, one, haven't you? I, I think I have. The question yeah. is whether you wanted me to really deal with the EAT's decision. I deal with some of the, um, uh, it, and I've got, I think, the wrong reference at paragraph 25. I've put the EAT decision at uh, paragraph 44. I think reading it this morning, I see it's at 53. Um, uh, but probably that doesn't really take us uh, uh, too far. I've dealt with uh, uh, paragraph 27, and I've also dealt with the analysis which takes us uh, to the end of paragraph, uh, ground one. So yes, my lord, um, I'm content to move on uh, to ground two if you're content for me to do so. Um, in, in relation to ground two, we see uh, uh, um, the case of Bennett uh, and the London Borough Suburb. And, uh, uh, sorry, from recollection, I think it's um, a decision of um, Lord Justice Sedley. Um, well, there's this court, including yes. Lord Justice Sedley. Yeah. Qu uh, quite a famous case yes. um, of the, um, uh, the advocate. Um, uh, Behaving outrageously and aborting the hearing. Yes, uh, I'm grateful, my, my lord. And and the reason why uh, what what we say this case is relevant is although it's on a slightly different point and it, it deals with the um, behaviour of the advocate um, which led to a strikeout, we submit that similar principles should be applied um, where your advocate has behaved or your representative has behaved badly. I use that in the loose sense. Um, and the idea uh, and the ability to dissociate yourself from their behaviour uh, should be a principle incorporated across the board, not merely in the relatively narrow circumstances uh, set out in Bennett. And it's uh, paragraph 26 of that decision which I um, quote at paragraph 38 of my skeleton argument, but you can find paragraph 26 at page 46 of the bundle of authority. And the point made there uh, by Lord Justice Sedley is the manner in which a party's proceedings are conducted um, is not the same thing, although it may be evidenced by the behaviour of the party's representative. So there's a difference between what your representative does uh, and um, uh, your conduct as a litigant uh, in a case. Secondly, what's done in a party's name is presumptively, if not irrebuttably, done on, on her behalf. There must be room for a party concerned to dissociate herself from what her representative has done. Uh, a principal can always prove a want of actual authority, and I don't believe that an advocate's ostensible or implied authority, large as it is, extends, at least in the absence of ratification, to abusing the judicial process. So the point made by uh, there is that where uh, an advocate goes off on a frolic of their own, that there should be and is uh, an opportunity for a party to dissociate themselves from the conduct of their advocate. And um, that's the question uh, which, uh, in my submission, this tribunal should have asked. You have a negligent and dishonest advocate, a representative. The tribunal needed to ask themselves, and has the claimant properly dissociated herself? from the conduct of her advocate, and uh, had they asked that question, um, uh, we say that that would have only led to one conclusion. Uh, I, uh, paragraph 41 of my skeleton argument, uh, attempt to reconcile Bennett and Lindsay, uh, and uh, make the point that um, the uh, failings of an advocate which amounts to an abusive process um, may be viewed uh, as sorry um, the, one can reconcile the two cases by drawing the distinction between the failings of an advocate it amounts to an, abu an abusive process and failings that fall, fall short of that and so then it's a case of abuse uh, and one can think of abuse as a type of exceptional circumstance which we see in Marsden, 
and um, the question for the court uh, or tribunal should be, um, is this abusive, is it dishonest, um, and then has the party been able to dissociate themselves from the conduct of their adversary? The uh, response against me on this point is that the tribunal made clear that the claim is blameless in this case. So what's said by my learned friend is, well, look, um, Mr. Kanza may be right, um, I don't even accept that, but maybe even if Mr. Kanza's right about Bennett being, the principles in Bennett being imported, <coughs> this is a case where the judge did allow the claimant to dissociate herself from her representative. Uh, and my response, is, uh, our response to that is that whilst the tribunal uh, found that the claim was blameless, that's different to allowing her and uh, making a finding that she has successfully dissociated herself from the conduct of, of her representative. No, dissociate is, is the wrong word in the present case. I mean, you, you can see in, in the Bennett case, <coughs> the, the claimant, if the tribunal had stood their ground um, in, in the face of the insults from Mr. Henry, Mr. Henry, um, the claimant might have had the opportunity to say, "I don't, I don't agree with Mr. Henry's allegation that you're a panel of racists." But here, the claimant doesn't doesn't know what's going on on the tribunal's finding. Then they strike out the claim. Then within two weeks or so. He applies to, to set it aside. I, I, I'm not sure that it makes any difference. The, the, the tribunal find that she was not implicated in any way in what was going on. Um, and then she makes the application to set aside. So maybe dissociation isn't, isn't the right word. Well, I, I suppose the question is, um, did the tribunal properly consider whether the conduct of the claimant's representative was done on her behalf. So the language is it's presumptively done on her behalf but not irrebuttably. And um, whilst I don't criticise the judge, if you remember a paragraph 21, where the judge says the claimant failed to respond and the claimant failed to what you can see there is the judge isn't dissociating the claimant conduct from her representative's conduct. Uh, and so um, that's my submission in relation to that. that well, um, what about the first sentence in paragraph 23? We are not persuaded. I know it's on the cost application. We are not persuaded that the claimant is implicated in the unreasonable conduct and the breach of the order. I mean. The findings, it's paragraph 13, isn't it? The findings yes. are very clear. Yes, my lady. I, I just wonder how much more you say this tribunal should have done, given, at least in paragraph 13, the clarity of those findings. I, I, I think the question is, is there a distinction between saying a party is blameless and saying that they have successfully uh, either dissociated themselves or what was done on their behalf was... Um, whilst it was presumptively done on her behalf, it wasn't done on her behalf. And you may conclude that they're one and the same thing, um, but um, my submission is, is that whilst I don't criticise the judge for using the language of paragraph 21, um, the claimant did not comply with the order and failed to respond to the strike out, and what the judge appears to be concluding is while she was blameless, she hasn't dissociated herself. Or it was... Pre I mean, the, a party is normally uh, presumed to have yeah. all the to have done the things that his or her, her representative has done on their behalf. Yes. And you say there's a difference between innocence and, dis and yeah. dissociation. I don't know about dissociation, yeah. but it's the presumptively done in her name. Yes. And he, you, you, what you say is that the that it was not irrebuttably done by her. And we can see that from the language of paragraph 21. Yeah. I'm grateful, my lady. Uh, and then, uh, 
finally, ground three, which is our perversity argument. Uh, I don't think probably I can take my written submissions too much further. Um, but what we know is the claimant didn't know about the 12th of March hearing. She didn't know about the application for the claim. She didn't know, um, she wasn't expecting to attend this substantive hearing. Um, she was unaware of the tribunal's unless she was unaware of her representative's failure to comply with the order. She was unaware of the strikeout meeting. She was unaware of uh, her representative's um, failure to respond to the strikeout meeting. Just before you go on, and while you're on those um, failures, my recollection from a long time ago is that when you are represented, the tribunal writes to you, or there's some form Don't that you... Yes, when the representative goes on the record, the tribunal then communicates just with the representative. Uh, yes. They, they don't continue to communicate with both the claimant and the That's correct. Yes, yeah, so, so once a lawyer or representative goes on the record, that changes where communication is funded yes. from. So the litigant in person um, no longer receives direct communication and it goes to their lawyer. Yes. So, so strictly speaking, all of these communications by the tribunal with the representative were procedurally correct because the yes. representative was on the record. Yes. But it, it does there come a point when some inquiry ought to have been made by the tribunal um, of the claimant herself, or do you accept that the procedures are correct I think it's very and difficult. ought not to change? I think it's very difficult for to... to we know the tribunal system is uh, overloaded, underfunded, <laughs> Uh, and um, I think the, uh, from what I hear from the solicitors calling tribunals, it's very difficult uh, for a tribunal to even pick up the telephone. And, often take, and, and when I make all of these observations, no criticism of any of the tribunal staff or the tribunals themselves. No, I understand. I'm just wondering whether there's, there is a point at which we might say something about the procedure and what might have been a better... I mean, in an ideal world, of this course... Is a, this is a very noddy question. I ought to know the answer, but do do, uh, do tribunals send out letters by post or email? It day? depends on which box you tick. Yeah. So right. if you tick the uh, email box, you'll get an email. If you tick the, tick the post box, you get... I, I wonder, following up on my lady's question, if, if one takes... A, a, I asked for a copy of the last of the warning letters um, because it, it's just useful to see the thing in its full horror. But the, 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 the letter of the 17th of December 2018 has the case name Dear Sir, Straight Madam, Strike Out Warning, Employment Tribunals, Rules of Procedure, Rule 37. On the application of the respondent, Employment Judge Dean is considering striking out the claim because you have not complied with the order dated 18th September. It has not been actively pursued. If you wish to object to this proposal, you should give your reasons in writing or request a hearing. And this was, I think, the last of a series. Um, but it's addressed only to Mr Johnston, who puts it in the bin as he did with all the previous ones. And does there come a point where at least a letter like this should be copied to the claimant? I think in an ideal world, the answer to that question is yes. Particularly where what one has is a failure to respond by a representative. But that does create a difficult situation for a tribunal because strikeout warnings uh, go out in lots of different formats. Uh, they go out for failure to respond. They have um, show cause strikeout letters. They have so they, they, um, the tribunal and tr system, tribunal judges have different ways of sending out a strikeout. There's not just one way of doing it. So sometimes mm -hmm. they send out a if you don't do X, we will strike you out. Um, uh, other times they say, and this can be fine for lawyers to understand, but the language is sometimes difficult, to show cause. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you don't show cause by responding, we will strike you out. And so the, um, and there can be a multitude of different reasons, non-compliance with the tribunal order uh, is 
usually um, uh, what provokes a strikeout if you don't attend the hearing and you'll get a um, show cause letter, etc. I think the in an ideal world, one would expect that if a representative has gone silent, absent without leave, that a tribunal should consider writing to the party themselves to say, we haven't heard from your representative. Um, but uh, I think that that would then require some procedural change from the uh, within the tribunal system to say, if you're considering striking out where uh, a representative has gone AWOL, then you must contact the claimant uh, um, and, or, or the party in the case. So well, I think that possibly. It, I mean, it might, be, it, um, it might be a rather radical step to say that a tribunal should write to a claimant saying, dear madam, your representative hasn't replied to the last three letters or whatever. We are considering striking out the claim you should do something about it. But I, w I was wondering whether um, if, a tr if a tribunal is, has reached the point of giving a, a warning or notice to show cause that a whole claim should be struck out, that that should be at least copied to the party apparently in default. I, I think that would be sensible. The question is, is it too onerous on the tribunal system? Well, the alternative yeah. may be that they go ahead and then there's a reconsideration hearing and appeal <coughs> to the EAT and appeal to this court and so on. Um, all right, well, anyway, that, that, so, that, so that's I think, as, I, I think as far as In broad terms, I think it's a, 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 yeah. my submission is it's a good idea yeah. and a, a matter for, for, for this court. All right. And, and so really on the perversity issue, what we say, uh, submit, is that on these facts, it is difficult to think of a case where reconsideration should not be granted. If not these facts, what, fa what set of facts? And um, the uh, point I make in relation to Marsden is Mr. Justice Underhill endorsed uh, the uh, fact that in that case, uh, there he uh, would have granted the um, reconsideration. But we say that the facts of this case are even more extreme. Um, and given the extreme nature of, of this case, um, that there was only one conclusion, which is the tribunal should have granted the uh, application for reconsideration. That then also deals with your, your earlier question about if we were to succeed on this appeal, uh, how should uh, the matter be dealt with and um, uh, the matter, um, we say, submit, can be dealt with by you, doesn't need to be um, uh, sent back down because there is only one answer. On the facts of this case, there is no, the claimant is entirely blameless and we have a negligent and dishonest representative who is the cause uh, of um, why we stand here today and in such circumstances, um, there, um, there hasn't been a proper suggestion of any real prejudice. Uh, on behalf of the respondent other than delay but that also similarly uh, affects the claimant and so <coughs> um, in, in such circumstances there hasn't been suggestion I think the phrase is forensic prejudice no suggestion of any forensic prejudice in this case and in those circumstances there can only be one conclusion in this case Thank you very much Mr. Martin I'm grateful um, I'm not going to accept my learned friend's invitation to the naughty step because I did put in a replacement skeleton. So uh, your worship has, <laughs> your colleagues has replacement skeleton. Yeah, it says do. exactly the your same. Your conduct thing. is entirely blameless. It simply has page numbers on it, so yes. that it, there's no need to read both documents. Um, my lord, I'm, go I'm going to take matters in as far as possible the same order in which uh, they appear in uh, my skeleton, and, and that in turn follows the grounds of appeal. So obviously. Yes. That the starting point is ground one. Um, whether or not um, this tribunal should be found to have treated Lindsay as an inflexible rule of law. And um, I'm grateful to my learned friend for uh, already taking the court to the relevant two paragraphs in um, the tribunal's reasoning and um, for setting out. What I have to accept is, is fairly limited reasoning in paragraph 21, but that does
doesn't alter the fact that, as Mr Justice Griffiths in the EAT properly observed, the decision has to be read as a whole, mm. and that, that is important not to just to carve out two paragraphs uh, and say that's insufficient. One has to step back and look at what the Employment Tribunal did in its reasons in applying the only test, which is the interest of justice. So in a nutshell, what was the reason why it wasn't in the interests of justice in this case? Because was it the default of her representatives? Because in this case, the tribunal was balancing not just the default of the representatives, but as the case of out of sight, which was uh, referred to by the tribunal, uh, but the interests of both the respondent and the claimant and also the public interest in finality of litigation and the burden on the tribunal system. And the way in which you can see how the tribunal approached this is by starting at, uh, at the um, case of Lindsay uh, and exactly why Lindsay's general proposition, as it's termed, um, causes concern. Um, my ladies, my lord, if I can take you to uh, it's the paragraph that's read already, uh, that paragraph, uh, subparagraph 5, page 33. What the, the party would always be able to come along and complain about his or her. Yes, there is that, but there, there's also the last Sorry. section as well, lady. So it's page 33. That you've had read to you uh, failings of a party's representatives, professional or otherwise, not generally constitute a ground for this. That is a dangerous path to follow. It involves a risk of encouraging a disappointed applicant to seek to re-argue his case by blaming his representative for the failure of his claim. That's my lady's point. But just, just pausing there, Mr. Martin. Apologies. Is there significance in the word re-argue? Potentially, yes. But, but the real mischief is in the last sentence. The real mischief that um, Mr. Justice Mummery, as you then was, was concerned mm -hmm. about is um, this, that may involve the tribunal in inappropriate investigations into the competence of the representative who is not present at or represented, so excuse me, or represented at the review. But this tribunal did the investigation. Mm, yes. They found him not only to be negligent, yes. but to have lied. Yes, but that, that, my lady, is very much the point, and it's the point that Mr Justice Griffiths emphasised in his judgment. The tribunal looked at that and said it's not inappropriate in this case, in the case before them, to make the finding of need, even though the representative wasn't present. Or uh, another way of looking at it was this isn't a case of somebody seeking to re-argue the case, as my Lord has said, by blaming his or her representatives. This is a case where they've been deprived of the opportunity to have their case heard by virtue of conduct of their representatives, so an, a, an investigation is entirely appropriate. Yes, or the inference is that the remedy or, or the damage that that causes to the claim could be mitigated by a claim against her representatives. And, and it's important to note, my lady, my lord, that this was very much at the centre of my predecessor's submission. So although it might be said, well, I'm speculating, Mr Justice Griffiths is speculating as to what the analysis of the tribunal was. The tribunal had in front of it a skeleton argument from the Respondents' Council, <coughs> emphasising the fact that the claimant's loss, as it were, could be dealt with by bringing proceedings against her representative. It's dealt with in the uh, Respondents' Council skeleton, and um, I have, I think, in a but That's book, wholly book, unrealistic, I mean, isn't it? I mean, that's it's just pie in the sky, isn't it? It, it is pie in the absolutely. sky. Absolutely. That, 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 in, in a case like this, that a claimant who is not of ample means, there's no legal aid, so she would have to find a firm of lawyers willing to take on a, a county court damages claim um, on a conditional fee basis, a case which, if it was fought to trial, would last several days, involve hundreds of thousands of pounds in costs, and if she got a judgment, uh, uh, the analysis of the case would involve 
the professional negligence analysis of what the case was actually worth. There are no witness statements from anybody at this stage. And at the end of the day, it seems to me highly likely that Mr. Johnston and or his company would not be good for any, mo any of the money. So any representative in their right mind would say, we're not taking this case on. Therefore, there is no um, alternative remedy. The, the, now, of course, you're entitled to say respondents have rights to um, out of sight and many other cases. Of course they do. Article 6 doesn't mean that only claimants have rights and that it, it would be an injustice um, uh, to your clients to, to uh, uh, have their um, effect default judgment taken away. But it does seem to me that the, what Mr Justice Mummery said in Lindsay about an alternative remedy is completely unreal. My lord, the alternative remedy point was not demurred from in the more recent case of Marsden, of course. In fact, one of the criticisms um, that's made is that, and I'm looking at paragraph 20 of Marsden, page 93 of the authorities, uh, and Mr Justice Underhill there says, as regards the error in the judge's reasoning on the alternative me remedy, that's the remedy against representatives that you've just been alluding to. Mm -hmm. um, point no said paragraph 18 above. Although the judge may have gone too far in discounting this point altogether. So there Mr Justice Underhill is saying that tribunals in assessing the interest of justice shouldn't simply discount the possibility mm -hmm. of an alternative remedy. So it's a factor that a tribunal can take into account. But it is this, inherently less satisfactory. I mean it's, it's just totally unrealistic here isn't it? On the first is an alternative remedy. It's a factor that this tribunal was entitled to take into account. Now, your court, my ladies, my lord, may well have taken a different view, <laughs> and, I, and I strongly sense would have done. <laughs> but, 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 my lord, you don't need reminding the role of the appellate court. But where in, in do they take the it into discretion. account? Show us a sentence that's where they do take it into account, or she does take it into account. Sorry, my lady, the, in, in the reasons. Yeah. In the tribunal's reasons. No, I accept, as I said at the outset, that it might be open to the criticism that I'm speculating, and indeed Mr. Justice Griffiths is speculating as to the extent to which uh, remedies against third parties was in the mind. Well, well it's just that. not in there in her reasoning at all. But I, d I accept it was argued, but it's not there, is it? But that can be the only reason, my lady, for the court making those findings. Unless they treated, uh, unless she treated the principle in Lindsay as a, a, as a as a some sort of fetter. Well, my lady, I, I say for the reason in my statement that that's not a fair reading of this judgment because it's not binary. The findings are not either it's a fetter or I'm right, and the reasons for the findings are to give a more promising claim against the third party. I don't accept those. I'm afraid those are binary outcomes. Um. On Marsden and the um, suggestion that if there is misleading of a tribunal, then in any case where there is misleading of a tribunal, there should be, which seems to be what my learned friend is saying, he's saying Mr Justice Underhill is endorsing the conclusion of the employment judge in Marsden, adopting it, and therefore what this court should do is read that circumstance across it. In my submission, that's not a fair reading of the facts of Marston. Because if one looks at paragraph 19, again, I'm, I'm going to take a pause and go back to, to the paragraph. That's all yes, that, 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 that's right. Can you just remind us what what counsel did wrong in Marston? What, what was the misleading? Um, Marston was the case where there was a preliminary hearing, hearing to determine the question of disability. There was some evidence of disability in the form of medical records. Mm. Those medical records and medical reports did not cover the issue of whether the impairment was long term. Um, Council said that the claimant didn't need to attend. At, it, it, well, it's slightly more nuanced than that. That point was raised by the employment judge. Right. Well, there's no evidence of long term impairment. I'd 
need to hear from the claimant. Yep. Uh, and the misleading aspect of the council's submissions on that occasion was he said he didn't know why the claimant was there. Wasn't there, excuse me. Uh, and the reality was as found uh, was that he had had a conference with the claimant and said you don't need to attend. Yep. So therefore, on the basis that that employment judge could not be satisfied of the long-term component of the disability discrimination uh, definition, uh, he found the claimant was not a disabled person and that had all, all sorts of negative consequences for her claim. So that's, that's the, the misleading there by the way, if that answers that question. Yes. But if I can just take you back to paragraph 19 with slightly more, more emphasis on certain um, words in that quote. Yes. Um, page 92. It does not follow that the judge's decision was fundamental reason in the role. It is clear that he attached decisive weight to the related facts. And the use of that language means that Mr. Justice Underhill here is looking at both A and B and linking the two together. So it's not just that the count, claimant's counsel misled the tribunal, mm. but also by doing so, he deprived him, that's the claimant, of an opportunity of an adjournment which otherwise would have been granted. Mm. Now that, that's right, and if one looks at the findings of fact of the tribunal in two um, locations, one, one can see what the consequences in this case on the facts of Marsden were for that claimant. And the two places I invite the court to, to look at, unfortunately, they typically bridge two pages of the uh, bundle. The bottom of 87, um, where there is a subparagraph number two, and Mr. Justice Underhill says at paragraph three, so paragraph three of the employment judge's reasons, he makes finding of fact on the reasons for the claimant's absence. These are not challenged, but I should set them out in full. They are as follows. So no the page, and there is at the top uh, two uh, paragraphs. Um, I, I'd invite the court to look at the very uh, last sentence of the second paragraph, starting if he had done so. If he had done so, or perhaps one sentence over, he should have informed the tribunal and made an application for a postponement on that ground. If he had done so, as I indicate in paragraph three of my reasons, I would very probably have allowed it, subject to an order for us which should not, in this event, have been disputed and should not have been paid by the claim. So, had there not been dishonesty by the applicant on that occasion, there would have been an adjournment for the claimant to attend and give the necessary evidence. But there's, there's one other component to the reasoning, which is at paragraph 89, so page 89, mm -hmm. paragraph 6 of the reasons, Little Roman 1, so this is, this is the judge's reasons again. Having read the claimant's witness statements, one undated and another dated the 29th of April 2009, I think it's highly likely that had he been present at the pre-hearing review and given evidence, subject to it being believed, he would have succeeded on the long-term effect principle, which was the decisive factor upon which I was not satisfied at the pre-hearing review. So the employment judge goes further there and says, well, I would have granted an adjournment. It would have been on terms that, that, that it's to cost, but those costs wouldn't have been paid by the claimant. And at that adjournment for the minimum claim, having read the evidence that the claimant put forward, it's likely that he would have succeeded in showing that he was disabled. So the consequences in Marsden for this claim on those facts are twofold. Not just the loss of an adjournment, but the loss of a finding, a likely finding, that he was disabled. Now, that is not the position in the case before this court. What the claimant here lost through the dishonesty of the plaintiff was the right to argue the case at all. Mm. There was no certainty of outcome, as, as my Lord has mm. highlighted in assessing the professional negligence consequences. Mm. There was no certainty of outcome in this case. But in Marsden, there was an identifiable likely outcome as found by the employer. Well, only a preliminary point in the That's process. True. There was still mm. all to argue for That's in true. terms of liability. That's true. It, was, it but, was a preliminary stage. But it was an important preliminary stage, and without disability being established, the rest of the claims would have been. Well, without being able to argue your case, the yeah. claim won't be established. But the, the point is really this, is that I don't accept, or the respondent does not accept, that Marsden creates another test. 
test which should have been applied by the tribunal in this case and the outcome should mirror Marsden. We don't accept that this court should find that every time there is a dishonest action by a representative that should lead to the interest of justice allowing it reconsideration. We don't accept that. I don't think that's what was argued. No, but there's suggestion of parity between this case, Marsden. On the facts. On the facts. But not as a principle of law. No, hopefully not. So I thought what you were saying is what this claimant lost is nothing like as serious as what the claimant lost in Marsden. Potentially, yes. Really? Yes. Because on this particular set of facts where Mr. Justice Unger was upholding and respecting the exercise of discretion of the employment judge, he is dealing with a case where the employment judge has found a defined outcome. This person would have been. Well, there's a defined outcome here. She would have been able to argue the merits of her claims. Potentially. And she was deprived of that. Everything was live in the claimant's case here before this court. Everything was live. In Marsden, the claimant would have succeeded on one component. She would have cleared one hurdle, if I can put it that way. Yeah, but liability was still to play for. Presumably, yes. Yes. I'm not sure I can take the reins in enough detail of the case. It's quite clear that disability was an important factor in that case. My Lord, yes. I think it's a bit of a parody to say that Mr. Kernzad is trying to get us to say that whenever there has been dishonesty on the part of the claimant's representative, there must be review or reconsideration when that comes to light. Or that he's trying to extract that from Marsden. What Marsden, what Mr. Justice Underhill seems to me to be saying in Marsden is, in this case, in the Marsden case, there was dishonest behavior by the claimant's counsel. That is very unusual. Indeed, it is exceptional. And combining the dishonest behavior of the claimant's counsel with the fact that on the finding of the employment judge, no fault whatsoever can be attributed to the claimant personally. That was good reason for the employment judge to have reached the decision which he did. And as Justice Underhill says at the end, if it had been down to him, he would have reached the same view himself. It would be absurd to set up a rule saying that whenever a party's lawyer is deceitful, therefore, and the claimant isn't implicated, therefore, there must be a review. Only that it may well be an exceptional circumstance. It's the use of phrases such as test, exceptional circumstance, test, which perhaps might cause me to oversell my learned friend's point. What is quite clear is Mr. Justice Underhill deprecates the encrusting, vivid phrase. And certainly, we endorse that. There shouldn't be encrustation of tests, whether it's reasonable opportunity or exceptionality tests. My Lord, that's what I was intending to say on Marsden and how that should be interpreted. You didn't particularly press my learned friend on whether or not the fair opportunity test can be read into other authorities such as Banerjee, et cetera. I've set out my response to that, which is really he's trying to divine a test which isn't there. The phrase may be there, but it's some distance from being a test that the tribunal in your case failed to apply. So I wasn't necessarily going to expand on that unless my learned friend always wanted me to. In terms of, I think that concludes ground one, actually, with my skeleton. In terms of ground two, there's essentially two components to that. The first is that the tribunal here hasn't fallen into error by not applying the principles in there. And that's the ground of appeal, because the 
principles in heaven are not matters to which the tribunal is required to have regard in assessing the interests of justice. It is not a case about the interests of justice. It is a case about strikeout. And one can see um, that the discussion uh, uh, by Lord Justice Sedley uh, is under a heading, page 45, of the authority of the just to, uh, just to contextualise everything that follows. Lord uh, Justice Sedley discussing that um, under paragraph 32, right at the top of page 45, was the case conducted in a scandalous manner. So not only uh, is it right to say that his comments are obiter, but they're also um, made in the context of consideration of what is meant by scandalous in the rule dealing with strikeout. That is an entirely different context from what the tribunal here has to do to apply the interests of justice test. There is something slightly um, awkward, isn't there, though, about paragraph 21 of the decision read in the context of all the other findings. Because having made the finding that the claimant, uh, the claimant's evidence was entirely accepted, she was innocent, not only was there negligence, but the representative had, uh, had been dishonest. They find that she didn't comply with the order, which is strictly true, but omits the fact that it was, she was innocent of any failing. They find she failed to respond to the strikeout warning, again, strictly true, but omits the failing. And then they say she relies on the default of her representative, unsurprisingly. Yes, my lady, that, that, that's right. I think my lady friend accepts that the language there has to be read in the context of the finding that it's not her personal responsibility when the tribunal... But nonetheless, it is all to be attributed to her when weighing up whether the interests of justice require reconsideration. I, in my submission, what the tribunal is doing is they're weighing all the factors. So they are concluding, in my submission, I don't want to retread this mm. point, but they are concluding that the claimant has an alternative remedy. And if balancing the consequences between the claimant's responsibility for her advantage and the respondent's responsibility for these two hearings being ineffective, the tribunal here is saying that that responsibility falls on the claimant. And it's as Mr Justice Griffith says, it's only the claimant who has the ability to police her own representatives. And he rightly says, and he's very cautious not to criticise her, and says in terms, I do not criticise her, but he says, correctly in my submission, that in balancing where the responsibility lies between the respondent's side and the claimant's side for these ineffective it tilts the balance reasonably in the claimant's side because they have a remedy, or she has a remedy, excuse me, against her advisors. This isn't this is important to realise that the claimant submitted a witness statement to this preliminary hearing. And if there were difficulties with her bringing the proceedings that the type that you, your lordship has outlined, one would have expected to have seen that in that witness statement, seen the submission made. And it wasn't. Well, well isn't it a matter of judicial notice? We, we understand what is required in order to prove uh, a, a, an, an uninsured representative is guilty of professional negligence and liable for the, lo for the, the amount that is assessed as loss of a chance, uh, and then good for the money. Yes, but the good, good for the money section is a section could have given evidence on if she thought there were some difficulties with the solvency of this organisation. That's something she, she may, may want to have said something about. Can we just look at the, the, the um, tribunal's uh, reasoning? It, it seems to me that, that paragraph 23, although under the heading wasted cost application, really comes earlier. It, it's part of I, I would say the findings of fact are 13, but paragraph 13 plus 23, um, that she, she gave this evidence about 
happened. We accept her evidence on this, and they make a finding. She's not implicated in the unreasonable conduct of the breach of the order, and they they, they set out all all of paragraph 23. So I, I, I think that, that goes above paragraph 21 in, in the logical sequence. Uh, and then we, we get paragraph 21, which says we don't consider it in the interest of justice to reconsider. Fine. She didn't comply and she failed to respond, but they, they, keep saying they, she, the judge, the judge. Um, uh, held that the claimant wasn't in fact implicated. So it, it, it's the representative who failed to respond. She relies on the default of the representative. And then the reasoning is the last sentence. Isn't it? I mean, what, what else is the In the expressed reasoning, no. Mm. But as I've said already, the, the basis for the tribunal making the findings that it did, contrary to what Lindsay suggests, Lindsay says it's not appropriate to make findings against the representative about their conduct because they've not given them an opportunity to be heard. In this case, the tribunal did do that. And the inference, again, without wanting to reach full ground, the inference of them doing that is that they are proceeding on the basis that claimant has a remedy against a third party, is which it, is an acceptable well, is it, fact for them to take account of Well, is it that, or is it that they're trying to work out where, whether this is a case where the claimant was able to police what happened and was somehow implicated? Well, why, why should we infer that this is about working out whether there's a claim in professional negligence, which isn't even referred to uh, Obliquely by the by the tribunal judge because the findings didn't need to be as thorough as they were if the tribunal weren't trying to improve uh, the prospects of the professional negligence claim. There was no need to make the findings as thoroughly as they did as to the investigation. Well, they were necessary for a wasted costs order, weren't they? Not to that level level of detail. What? Who says? What? On what basis do you say that? Because all that needs to be found on, on a costs order against the claimant is whether or not she was implicated in the unreasonable conduct. But they needed they to go on to find, make findings about the, the rep's conduct as well, didn't they? Yes, that's necessary for the wasted costs yes. order. They need to make findings about whether or not his yes. behaviour was improper, unreasonable or negligent. Yes, so it's nothing to do with whether she's got a professional negligence claim against it's in order to determine what costs should be ordered, if any, against the representative and the extent of the representative's culpability. But there's an overlap, isn't there? Because if they're considering the negligence component of the wasted cost test, then that necessarily will improve her prospects of a professional negligence. Well, it might or it might not. It might not have featured in the judge's thinking at all. We just don't know because she didn't say so. And if there's a deficiency in the reasoning, let's say, in this case, I think in the correct approach is to send it back for elucidation of the reasons for the claimant's decision. If there's uncertainty as to that, it's within the user's discretion. Well, it, it shouldn't uh, the application of Rule 70, brackets 1, brackets E, um, be a balancing exercise? Um, uh, as we know, most reconsideration applications are hopeless because they're, they're typically a, a party has lost at a hearing and just wants to re-argue everything that was at the hearing in person. Put those to one side. This is a case where whatever was done at the July hearing would cause some injustice to one or other party. And I would have expected uh, uh, the reconsideration judgment to say something like this. On the one hand, it would be very tough 
on the claimant, who was not personally at fault, to have her claim struck out. It, it was tough on the claimant to have her claim struck out on the 4th of January by letter because of a series of defaults on the part of Mr Johnston, um, of which she had no knowledge. On the other hand, respondents had rights too, um, uh, and it would be very <coughs> hard on the uh, em employers uh, for this claim to be revived. Um, they had been subjected through Mr Johnson's dishonesty to the, um, to the February 2018 hearing uh, being aborted at pretty short notice. Um, uh, then there were further delays, and then when they'd already delivered the brief to council for another four-day uh, hearing slot in January, um, uh, the tribunal at, at the last moment pulls the plug and strikes out the proceedings. Um, we have to balance the uh, what the interests of justice require involves balancing uh, these two competing uh, arguments and we consider blah 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 but none of that we've just got the last um, sentence of paragraph 21 the reasons are as they are mm. and it could have been that the tribunal could have adopted the submissions on all of those points in respondents reasons. They didn't, but they did direct themselves um, that it should be exercised in regard to the interests of both parties and the public interest. Now, as terms of them setting out how they did that, I have to accept that that isn't me expressing a reason. I can't create what, what isn't there, my Lord. Mr. Martin, yes, I'm not unsympathetic to your attempt to defend the terseness of this judgment. But it would have taken one sentence, no more, on the alternative remedy point. I say this less by way of excuse than explanation. The court may have noticed, my lady may have noticed, the delay in the reason yes. being yes. my, my lady. So I suspect that, as an explanation, maybe why the reasons are not as fulsome as they might otherwise be. Do we know why it took so long? I think Cook, I think this is a, it's a very unhappy history. COVID. COVID, COVID certainly uh, caused a lack of staff in the tribunal. Well, wait a minute, no, it can't yeah. be, can it? The, the, the decision is July, uh, the, the actual, the hearing was July 2019. Um, what was the, was the judgment without reasons issued then or almost immediately? Know that the, sorry, and then, the, then there's then there's reasons signed on fifth March twenty twenty. Um, that's um, three weeks before the lockdowns began. And then it says sent to the parties on 9th March twenty twenty one. Is that is that because that's of the that's that, that, as I understand it, employment tribunal office closed. Much correspondence going. Where are the reasons? Giving a potted history, my lord. Um, and my learning so that's it. That date is correct, is it? So the parties, that, that date is the parties didn't have the reasons until nearly two years after the the hearing. That is right, and the, the employment judge doesn't seem to have prepared them until over a year after the uh, original. Well, mm. July seven or eight months. Seven or eight months. Mm. Yeah. Ah, yes. None of this is your or your client's fault, but it does make one feel depressed. Well, well I just want to finish ground two, if, if I Yes, may. of course. There were two components to our yes. The first is whether or not that the principles, as they are set out, should have been applied by the tribunal in this case, and whether or not they're restricted to discussion. Strike out application. But the, the second component is... The claimant makes um, particular criticisms of how those um, principles should have been applied by the tribunal and words. And I, I think that 
the court has rather um, stolen my thunder on that in the sense that I'm not sure dissociate is, is quite the right concept here. Um, so, cer certainly, and we've been through them, there are findings that the claimant was not culpable, um, that it, it wasn't done with her knowledge and awareness, and there was evidence filed by her which was accepted, as you can see at paragraph 30 of the reason. So I'm not sure, to adopt my lady's formulation, what, what more the tribunal could have, could have really have done in, in allowing the claimant to dissociate herself, or, or in considering whether or not the failings of the reference that were um, to be equated with her failings. I, I believe they dealt with that, and I, and I don't think, even if you're against me, that the principles in fairness apply, that the uh, tribunal here have failed um, in the manner set out by my learned friends at paragraph 42 of their um, skeleton. Um, Perversity, I'm, I'm going to be, my Lord, as, as brief as my learned friend was on that subject, because the test for perversity in the verdict is, is a high one, properly in the verdict, which is familiar to my Lady and my Lord. And, uh, and I say that this um, case falls short of the overwhelming, in the formulation, that's an overwhelming case that no employment judge could have reached the conclusion that this employment judge did not said earlier, simply because an appellate tribunal takes a very different view does not mean inexorably that the first instance tribunal's decision was perverse. And we say this falls short of that threshold. Well, there's nothing else I wanted to say in terms of friend's skeleton. Um, I had an observation about um, in response to my lady's comments about what can be done, what can be done in these circumstances. Um, the tribunal's are on the point, or the tribunal service is on the point of using a digital system. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure how well or two of that progress, but I think it's, it's been piloted. Mm. And one would hope, it's merely as a suggestion, if everything is done digitally and the claimant is required to provide an email address, that when the point arrives that the claim is going to be struck out, the system could be programmed to send that email to both the claimant and the representative. Now, no doubt if I had an IT expert behind me, I'd hear the sound complaining and saying it's no good, really that's straightforward, why the barristers just assume that it's true. But I think the alternative. Of, of, of having the tribunal staff monitor how many times the representative didn't respond, I think it is not necessarily feasible. But if we've got an electronic system coming in, and there are ways of programming at a certain point in case life to send an email to two people, that would seem to be possibly one of the solutions. Not sure if that's unsolicited comment. Very helpful. Um, well, look, can I just further? Can I just ask this? Uh, we're, we're in as good a position, if we get to that position, uh, to weigh up where the balance of prejudice lies in this case, aren't we, as the tribunal? And I'm just wondering whether the respondent would consent, even if uh, this is not a case where we could say only one conclusion is possible, one inevitable conclusion is possible. Well. My lady, seeing what's said in my skeleton in terms of outcome, um, that skeleton was approved by my client. The um, Court of Appeal is invited to dismiss the appeal of the submission of what allows the appeal must not submit to the application for reconsideration which should be remitted. So more costs, another hearing? It's, mm. If there's uncertainty as to the reasons in the court perhaps for this employment judge, they're, they're entitled. They're entitled? They're entitled to comment on those. That's the, yes, the procedure, as you know, in the EAT, when someone alleges mm -hmm. inadequate reasons. Yes, yes. You're, my lady's well familiar with Yes. And uh, uh, um, my instructions are that is what should happen here. So I'm afraid I don't have instructions to comment on that, except I hear what my lady says. Mm -hmm. And what about the inordinate delay in this case? How does that factor into any decision to remit? Does it factor in? Well, 
my lady, the reality is, is that remitting for short reasons is unlikely to, to delay the listing of a final hearing because of the delays inherent in the system anyway. It's not the case that this claimant would get a much faster hearing if the Court of Appeal took a decision today. I'm afraid the reality of the tribunal system is it wouldn't make much material difference because it would be dealt with as, I suspect, box work by the employment judge and the reasons could be uh, amplified quite quickly. And directions could be made by that employment judge for case management and relisting. be very brief in, in reply. I think you have the point which I'm about to make in, in any event. The, the word test can mean different things in different situations. We're not suggesting an if A then B test. So if there's deception, a tribunal must reconsider. Uh, if a party doesn't have an opportunity uh, to, to state their case, they must reconsider. If there are exceptional circumstances, they must reconsider. Those types of tests are an incrustation on the statutory language and on the exercise of discretion. They are, they are an express better on the exercise of discretion. We don't um, a, 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 a ask the court to, to, make, uh, to, to establish us such a test. What we say is that, submit is that um, uh, it's a more general observation in the same way that generally the failings of a party uh, don't lead themselves to a valid grounds for, re, uh, for reconsideration. Uh, so too where a party has been denied a fair opportunity, that may well be. Conversely, that may, may well be good grounds for review. But ultimately, uh, it's always a matter of discretion for the tribunal. So is it strictly a test? Um, perhaps not. Um, certainly not an if A then B type test. Um, it's simply placing importance of, on um, whether a party has a fair opportunity and the issue of deception or dishonesty on behalf of Thank you very much. We're grateful to both sides for the concise and forceful arguments, both uh, in the skeleton arguments and orally um, today. I wish it were always so. Um, you've both covered the ground admirably. Thank you very much. We will let you have our decision as soon as we can. And as I'm required to say, every case, although Council are well aware of it, firstly, uh, we, we, we will send out a decision in draft, not for re-arguing the case, but for correction of obvious factual errors and typos. And secondly, that um, draft is subject to the confidentiality requirements laid down in the Council General of Wales as a case to which my lady was a party. Thank you very Bye. much.